Hello, everybody. Uh, this lecture is going to be on, on systematics, basically how we organize the organisms on planet Earth. Um, that process is referred to as classification. Um, basically, again, arranging organisms into groups based on similarities that reflect evolutionary relationships among lineages. So there's a lot of new terms in here. A lineage is just a sequence of species. So each evolved from its predecessor. So that's so whenever you hear lineage, we are talking about species that are descended from one another. Okay, um, and uh, we're also in this. Uh, uh, video going to talk about taxonomy. So that's the science of naming and describing the organisms as well as classifying them as well. Also, okay. Um, so one thing to kind of think about in here, uh, we humans, we really like to organize things, right? So think about your own closet. I bet many of you can identify with, you have your closet organized, maybe you have pants here and shirts here. And then if you just look into your shirts, um, you have those separated into long sleeve shirts and short sleeve shirts. And then just looking at your short sleeve shirts, maybe you have those separated to those that are plain and those that have logos and those that are buttoned down. Right, so you classify your own something as simple as your closet. And that's really kind of the same thing. So where you have kingdom pants and kingdom shirts, we have uh, separated into three different cell types, right? Um, and so we're gonna, or I'm sorry, that that's domains. I saw the, the domain on the slide here. Um, you know, we separate that into different broad groups like plants and animals and fungi, right? Um, so that's just kind of keep that in mind as we're going through the uh, um, slideshow here. Okay, so first of all, um, we need to kind of understand how we name species, right? And this happened, we follow a method developed by a man named Carulus Linnaeus. He's the one who developed the system of naming organisms to allow scientists to communicate with one another more clearly. So before the mid 18th century, each species had a really lengthy complex name, sometimes 10 Latin names, I think is what your book said. Um, and even uh, sometimes just using what we might call the common name. And so people didn't really always know that you were talking about the same species because they may have used a slightly different name. So what Linnaeus did is he came up with um, this here, turn my laser on, uh, the binomial system of nomenclature. So nomenclature means naming, a naming system. Binomial, bi means two, and nomial is names. So he, each species is assigned a unique two-part name. So the first one is a noun, I can get this to work, there we go. Um, a noun that designates the genus, right? And then the second portion is an adjective that modifies that noun, okay? And that's referred to as the specific epithet, okay? Um, but then together we get, um, when you use the genus and the specific epithet together, that's what we refer to as the species name. So let me give you an example of um, an American animal called the American black bear, okay? Um, and so its genus name is Ursus, okay? Ursus in Latin means bear, okay? Its uh, specific epithet is Americanus. And sometimes we just refer to that as, as the species, Okay, the species name, but it isn't the total species name. Together is this uh, Ursus americanus, right? Um, so americanus means it's a bear that's found in America, right? In the Americas. Um, and so uh, you can see americanus is describing the noun, the, ge the genus name. Okay, so it's really important that you use this method of of naming species, of, of using species names whenever you do. And most commonly in the sciences, you may have to write a paper and you may have to use species names. So notice what I have here. I have it written in italics. So it's very important whenever you write a species name 
that you do use, uh, you do write it in, a uh, excuse me, in italics, okay? When you're type typewriting it, okay? Doing it on some kind of typewritten paper. If you're handwriting something, sometimes you turn in handwritten things, right? Then you underline it. It's hard to write in italics and you shouldn't try because it just looks messy and people don't know what you're trying to do. So instead, if you're handwriting something, then you need to underline each uh, name. You need to underline separately the, the genus and then underline separately the specific epithet. Okay, so again, together, this is Ursus americanus, that's the species. Okay, and so all around the world, if you're going to write an article on the American black bear, you would use Ursus americanus because somebody else might be studying brown bears, but brown bears can also be brown and or black and, and blonde and other colors. Even black bears can sometimes be brown, right? So somebody who doesn't know that might be looking at this picture or, you know, you say you're studying black bears and um, they are looking at a picture of a brown bear that's actually black. So this way, you know, you're talking about this specific species, okay, Ursus americanus. I think the brown bear um, and it is, is um, Ursus horribilis, which stands for horrible. Um, I need to look that up to be sure, but I'm pretty sure that's the um, species name for the brown bear. Okay, um, so again, so now you know, make sure that you are writing <laughs> your um, species names correctly. You can be taken off, marked off for that if you don't write them correctly. Okay. All right, let me show you some other things though, uh, why um, it's important to write the species names correctly. So sometimes like you, my niece did this actually years ago. Sometimes people think, well, you ask for the species name and they just say Americanus. So again, no, that's the specific epithet. Okay, the species name is Ursus Americanus. And here's why that could be confusing. So here are two pictures of two different trees. This one is a white oak. This one is a white willow. Okay, the species name for the white oak is Quercus alba, right? The species name for the white willow is Salix alba, right? Alba means white. So if somebody asks you, hey, what's the species name of this? And you just say alba, that doesn't mean anything to anybody. It get white, okay? That doesn't mean anything. More importantly is the genus name, Quercus. Right now, you know, it's in the um, uh, genus of the oak trees, Quercus, that tells you it's an oak. Alba, then this means it's a white oak. There's also black oaks, there's red oaks, there's uh, coast live oaks, there's a lot of different types of oaks. So now this one drills it down specifically, you mean this specific species. Okay, Salix means willow. Okay, so again, you just call this Alba, that just means white. I don't know if you're talking about a white oak, a white, a white willow, there's all different types of trees that might have the name white in it. So this is the descriptor. This is, the noun is salix, a willow. <clears throat> the description is white. This is a white willow. There are other species. So again, species name requires both names. If I knew this was an oak, but I didn't know if it was a black oak, a white oak, a whatever, then I can just say quercus. And I might say quercus with an SP, and I don't italicize the SP. SP stands for species. So that means I know it's in the genus Quercus, but I don't know the species name, okay? Same with this, Salix, SP. Or I'm just talking about oaks in general. Then you can just put Quercus, okay? I'm just talking about willows in general. Then you might just put Salix, okay? Um, if uh, in your paper you're writing about oaks and you use the species name again and again, it gets pretty tiring to write Quercus alba, Quercus alba. You know, some species names are really long, like uh, there's a dolphin called Lagonorhynchus obliquidens, <laughs> right? That takes a long time to write that out every time. So there's a method of, um, of uh, abbreviating so after the first time in your paper, early on the first time you mention your species, you write it out. And then after that, you can just write, you can just abbreviate the genus. So you just use the capital first letter. So in this case, Q period, and then ALBA. So now I can just say Q ALBA. 
right? Also, the other thing to notice when you're writing, genus is always capitalized, it's a noun. The species name is never capitalized or the specific epithet is never capitalized, okay? So that maybe that seems a little confusing to you, but you'll get used to it as you go. And one of the problems with the internet now is I see a lot of people write species names incorrectly. So you have to make sure that you are writing species names incorrectly. You will get marked down in science classes. I will mark you down in science classes for that, okay? Um, and uh, so it's really important that you write them correctly. All right. Um, why, why, again, why do we use species names? I had mentioned that common names can be confusing. Here's another example. Uh, this is called a silky oak, this tree. This one is a coast live oak, really common. Both of these are common in Southern California, okay? But when you look closer, they're actually very different. Here's the leaves of the silky oak, and I didn't zoom in on the flowers, but they have these really showy flowers. The um, coast live oak, look at the leaves of the coast like oak, very different. So even just an amateur, you would look at these and you go, these are really, really different trees. Okay, and here's the acorns that are associated with them. They actually get really small flowers, the coast live oak, not like this. You usually uh, miss the flowers of an oak tree. Okay, so these are actually very different species. So the common name is confusing. This is, uh, so people ask me, what's that tree called? And I tell them it's a silky oak, but it's not an oak tree. I always have to say that, okay? But if it's my friends who are, uh, understand scientific names or they're botanists or something, then I might tell them it's Gravelia robusta, okay? Um, and uh, this one is Quercus agro agrifolia, okay? Okay, so um, this helps us a little bit better, Gravelia, what does that mean? Sometimes species names are actually the name of a person, right? Grafilia was named after a man named Charles Francis Graville. He was a co-founder of the London Horticultural Society. Okay, and so horticultural society, horticulture refers to plants. So he was an important person and either he discovered it or um, uh, people respected him enough that they named it after him. You can look into the history of that. Uh, robusta just means strong. Okay, so somebody looked at this and wanted to describe it as a strong tree. So here, Quercus means oak. So now we know we're talking about oaks. Agrifolia means field-like leaf. So sometimes that might not make sense to us at the moment, but I bet if you really studied plants and studied oak trees, there might be a reason for that, uh, for this uh, name. Okay, but it's stuck. All righty. So that's, that's uh, the species name. But Linnaeus also gave us a system of hierarchy, developed a system for assigning species into a hierarchical group. So each group here, you get into an increasingly broader group, right? So we saw that uh, species are very specific to specific type of, of uh, organism, right? But maybe that specific type of organism belongs within another group. Like I told you, there are several species of oak trees. Right, so there's a genus of oak trees, right? But oak trees may fall within a family that involves other trees that are not oak trees, right? And then so on. And you can see the, the triangle here is upside down because this means with each uh, larger category, it is a larger category, more groups of organisms fit into the larger category. So I've got another example. Let's go back to that American black bear. Um, and so now I have it kind of set up uh, where you can see we start with the species Ursus americanus, that's the American black bear, right? Well, there are actually eight species of bears alive today, okay? Three of them are considered within the bear genus, right? Ursus, okay? And so we have a polar bear and also this is the brown bear again. And um, a subspecies of brown bear is the grizzly bear, right? So grizzly bear is actually a brown bear, um, but this is a species that doesn't have enough characteristics to make it its own individual species, but it's, it's um, differentiating because it tends to live in a little different area, has a different lifestyle. That's what a subspecies would be. So you might even get intermediate categories in between these, okay? Okay, so the genus is, is Ursus, we've got three in there, um, but I mentioned there are five, eight species of bears alive, right? So that 
then would be the family within the Ursa day. Family tends to end in D-A-E, okay, D-A-E. A little bit different in um, plants, it tends to end in E-A-E, okay. So you start to get used to these as you study and pay attention more to scientific names, right? So here is just showing five of them, uh, five of the species. But this one, so another um, genus would be Tremarctos. Right, that's the spectacle bear. They're not showing the other ones in here. Uh, Melursus, that's a sloth bear. So sloth bears live in Asia. Spectacle bears live in South America. These three bears are North American bears, right? The brown bear, the polar bear, and the brown and the black bear. Okay. Um, uh, Helarctos, the sun bear, that's in Malaysia, right? Ale Aleopoda, that's the um, panda bear, right? So that's a bear that lives uh, in Chinese provinces, okay? But from there, so these, these include all the bears, so that's still Ursa Day, right? The next category up is an order. So in this group, uh, our bears fit in the order carnivora. So carnivora is a group of meat-eating animals, right? And so here you've got our, all our bears fit in there. But it's a broader category, not just bears fit in the group of carnivora. We might have groups of cats and dogs that live in there. There's a wolf. Okay, so it's getting broader. Okay, up from there is the class. So all of these animals are mammals, but so are other animals. So now we've got dolphins, we've got hoofstock. These are herbivores, so they don't fit in the carnivora, but they are mammal. Okay, so mammals have. Um, uh, they give milk to their young, they feed their young with milk, they have hair. Even the dolphin uh, as an embryo has hair, but it loses it when it's born. Okay. Um, it's got um, three ear bones, middle ear bones. That's what makes it, that's what requires you to be in the class mammalia, right? But different classes belong in a phylum, chordata. So chordata is the phylum in which mammalia, the class mammalia fits to, but so does the class amphibia, the frogs, right? So does the class aves, birds and reptiles, right? Reptilia and fish, actinopterygii. We're gonna learn all of these, okay? And all of, what do all of those have in common? Well, they belong to the kingdom animalia. But now we've got, now we've got um, uh, uh, insects, arthropods, other things, other organisms in there that fall under animalia, sea stars, sponges. Okay, so it's much broader. And what do all they have in common? They are all eukaryotes. And now we had to add the plants in there and the fungi and the um, protists. These are all eukaryotes. Okay, so that's the broadest category. All righty, um, one more example I have of, the, of that. Oh, one thing to, to remember, you, you wanna try to remember this order, species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. You always know domain's the biggest one. So I remember it by saying, um, I go down, uh, just remember this, it's called an acronym, okay? Kings play chess on funny girl stomachs. Hey, rewind that if you need to. So that reminds me that's the first letter of each one is the first level letter of each one of these. So even I, when I'm teaching, um, I might go, so the next above family is, and then I forget, is it order or class, order or class, and right? In my mind, I go, kings play chess on funny, so it's order, okay? So that's one way to remember that. And you might come up with other ways. There's probably find a lot of ways on the internet. Okay. Um, here's just another example, too, of plants. So here's our coast live oak and our sickly oak again. And so again, here you see that kingdoms, they, they're both in the plant kingdom plant day. Plants sometimes do things a little bit differently. And also um, uh, when um, we're, we've got new techniques to study species, especially with DNA now that we can um, uh, sequence DNA, we're starting to reclassify things and under and make different classification categories. So right now the term clade is not an official category. Clade is just a group of organisms believed to have evolved from a common ancestor. Okay, so uh, clade, you don't see it in this um, uh, kingdom phylum 
cl uh, class order, so on and so forth, right? You might see subphylum, superphylum, but you don't see clade in there. And again, it's just more of a general term. But what I did is I color coded to see, show that each of these are plants and they're trees. And so they belong in uh, a specific groups as we get more um, uh, detailed, right? So remember the tracheophytes, both of these trees then have tracheids. They have uh, con uh, con water conducting and food conducting vessels, but these are angiosperms, remember? So they're flowering plants. So we got a little bit more specific because not all tracheophytes are flowering plants like the ferns and gymnosperms, remember those, right? But the type of flowering plants they are, they're eudicots, remember? So their flowers have five petals to them and other things. Their leaves are, have a, a net-like vein pattern, right? So they belong to the eudicots, but then when we get to the order, then it changes. And now we know that these are very different trees. Now you see the different coloration, order, family, genus, and species are different. Okay, so again, this is this is the overall classification system, and you'll start to get used to it the more you work in um, uh, the more you start to work in um, uh, biology and learning names. You don't have to memorize the names of all species, of course not. It helps you look it up, but it does help you to recognize, am I looking at a genus? Am I looking at a family name, right? Um, and again, as you start to look at the words, you start to see uh, specific um, root words and things like that that are used, okay? So I'm going to uh, pause the video here um, and actually end the video here. This will be part one of our classification. So thank you guys. For listening. Um, what we'll do in part two is we will get into the actual three domains of life and get into the eukarya and start to look at how we classify eukarya. Uh, we'll also look briefly at bacteria and archaea as well. Alrighty, thank you.